Hello. So this lecture <clears throat> is designed to introduce you to the basic uh, structures, mechanics of Hebrew poetry. Uh, much of the book of Jeremiah is written in uh, poetry, uh, along with a lot of the Old Testament. <clears throat> Excuse me, not only the book of Psalms, of course, but also other books such as Proverbs, um, uh, the book of Job along with the majority of the writings of the prophets are written in poetry. Uh, because Hebrew poetry uh, is a little bit different than perhaps what you're used to, uh, this lecture is just designed to help give you the tools to be able to analyze, understand what's going on as you're reading Hebrew poetry, the basic way that it is framed and structured. Okay? Now, beginning with this discussion, uh, I wanted to give a bit of a poem that you're probably familiar with. <clears throat> this is by Robert Burns called A Red, Red Rose, and it is an example of maybe what is uh, sometimes anticipated uh, by English readers of poetry. So, in A Red, Red Rose, it reads, Oh, my love's like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my love's like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. As fair art thou, my bonny lass, so deep in love am I, and I will love thee still, my dear, till all the seas gone dry. Okay, so when you read through this, um, you kind of want to think through, well, what makes this a poem? Like, what features does this have that would make it poetry and not prose? Um, so, of course, there is a metrical pattern, like there's a rhythm to the text as you're reading through it. Um, you naturally want to pause at certain points and, you know, read with a certain cadence. Uh, there's also a rhyme, which is very prominent. June, tune, I, draw. I mean, these are very prominent rhyming structures um, that is uh, very easy to pick up on. Um, there's a lot of other features, such as metaphor. You know, what is? Why does he say that his loves like a red, red rose? Like, what's? What is a red, red rose like? And why is love like that? Um, and so you think, you know, well, it smells pretty, or it looks beautiful, and all these different things that you might, you might analyze as part of it being poetry. Now, Hebrew poetry was. Um, for a great long time, it was, it was fairly misunderstood. Um, and the reason why is because Hebrew poetry was being analyzed according to the sort of standards, the norms of Greek poetry. Now, this is going all the way back to Josephus. Josephus was describing uh, David's Psalms as, you know, he was comparing it to certain structures within Greek poetry. And the reason why he did that was, um, at least I think, is, you know, he's trying to give a history of the Jewish people for the Romans. And the Romans had a great respect for the literary tradition, the, uh, the poetry of Greek culture. Um, and he basically was, he wanted to present the Jewish history in a way that was understandable to them. And he was basically saying, look, um, we have great poetry too. Read the Psalms. They stand up to the best of the Greek poetry. And he was trying to put that sort of a spin on it. And Hebrew poetry was largely analyzed according to, you know, these standards, pentameter, you know, things like that, that were common within Greek poetry. Now, it wasn't until Robert Loth, um, he was a bishop in the Church of England and a professor of poetry at Oxford, that he kind of uh, put the study of Hebrew poetry on a new course. He published in 1753 um, his Lectures on the Sacred Poetry of the Hebrews. That's a very shortened title. Um, it was, you know, as titles of books went, it was quite expansive. But he identified that it wasn't these metrical patterns that were standard in Greek poetry. Rather, he said it was parallelism was the basic feature of Hebrew poetry. And he identified three types of parallelism, what he called synonymous parallelism, antithetical parallelism, and synthetic parallelism. And Robert Loth's analysis of Hebrew poetry 
was the dominant view for a very long time in the study of uh, Hebrew poetry. That was, you know, very strong. Um, now, two uh, scholars, James Kugel and Robert Alter, uh, they developed their theories about Hebrew poetry and the basic structure, building off of Loth, um, but uh, refining it in a fairly significant way. Um, interestingly enough, uh, they seem to have developed their ideas at such, like they were so similar and really right at the same time that there was actually some accusations that, you know, of copying or plagiarism that is happening. I think James Kugel had published his first, but Robert Alter's students were able to verify that, you know, his theory had been taught in his class. It just so happened that it was just developed, you know, a great idea by two uh, brilliant scholars at the same time. <clears throat> and they said that it was not so much that Hebrew poetry had this focus on parallelism as, you know, synonymity or sameness between two lines, but rather the focus was more on consequentiality, that it was you had something stated in line A and then a further consequence or development in line B. So you would say A and what's more, B. Okay, so we'll hopefully explain a little bit of, of what this means. Um, these, their basic ideas were then further developed and expanded by uh, another, I believe she's at Oxford, Susan Gillingham. Um, and she uh, refined these ideas in her work on the poems and psalms of the Hebrew Bible. Um, but then... Her, you know, so we'll be taking largely from Susan Gillingham, but then her approach as another place, you know, one scholar builds on top of another. Um, Gillingham's approach is also summarized and then even expanded further in Introduction to Biblical Interpretation, um, which is really, if you're looking for a one textbook on hermeneutics and biblical interpretation. That is a very uh, excellent resource. Fantastic, covers so much and does it so well. I don't think there's anything quite like it. So in this now, for the rest of um, this lecture, we're going to be talking about Hebrew poetry and expanding on these basic ideas. Um, start, you know, the ideas started with Robert Loth, um, really taken to the next step by Kugel and Alter, and then refined by Susan Gillingham, um, really. And so those are the, the three types of, uh, of Hebrew poetry that we'll be looking at. So the first type, type one, is A equals B. Okay, this is type one. Now in this type, A and B are interchangeable to an extent, and B is going to either echo or contrast A. So when we say A and B, we're talking about, you know, line A, line B, and line B is going to either echo or contrast line A. Okay, so this is the basic structure of Hebrew poetry. So, and the first example is line, or sorry, uh, the Psalm 6, verse 9. And it reads, uh, this is giving it, and I give it in Hebrew with a sort of interlinear uh, translation uh, below. So, Shema is he hears, and then the subject, uh, Yahweh. And then, Tichanathi. This is my pleading, Tichanathi, my pleading. So Yahweh hears my pleading. And then the second line, Yahweh. So I'm sorry, I didn't say this, but hopefully you've caught on. Hebrew reads from right to left. Okay, so then the second line, Yahweh, Tifilathi, my prayer, Tifilathi, my prayer, Yekach, uh, Yahweh receives my prayer. So the first line, Yahweh hears my pleading. Second line, Yahweh receives my prayer. Here is it illustrated just a little bit differently, and you can see I've drawn dotted lines connecting words that are more or less synonymous. Hearing and receiving, the verbs at play there, 
these uh, verbs are more or less synonymous, um, conveying the same basic idea. Um, and of course you have Yahweh is repeated in both sides, and then Tichanathi, uh, my pleading, Tifilathi, my prayer. You can even hear like the similar sound between those two. Um, that is being echoed in each one, and my prayer, my pleading and my prayer are both kind of synonymous in meaning, okay? Now, again, this is, I'm going to give some more examples here just to look at this. Now, um, this type 1, A equals B, uh, can be used in both what we call synonymous structures and also in contrasting structures. So you have the synonymous. Here's another example, Psalm 139. For you formed my inward parts, you wove me in my mother's womb. Both of these, you know, formed and wove, um, you know, these are conveying similar ideas. And now here we have the next one, Psalm 146. This is a, an example of contrasting. This one's a little more complicated because it's not just a bicolon, two lines of poetry. It's actually a tricolon, so three lines of poetry. So here we have the Lord supports the strangers, he, or sorry, the Lord protects the strangers. He supports the fatherless and the widow. Now, taking just those two, that would be a synonymous, um, you know, form here. You know, the synonymous structure. The Lord. Now, it's the Lord is not repeated in the second line, but it's implied. The Lord protects the strangers, and then He supports. It's understood that. It is Yahweh who is the one who is the subject in that. So protecting the strangers, supporting the fatherless and the widow, protects and supports are, you know, similar kind of ideas. And then you have, you know, these three groups, strangers, fatherless, widows, or you could say immigrants, orphans, and widows. Um, these are all pre presented as sort of synonymous concepts. Well, what's what's the same? A widow and an orphan are very different. An immigrant is very different from a widow. Um, yes, on one level. On another level, you examine, you, you consider, these are all vulnerable people in society. And matter of fact, uh, the law code, the laws of... Um, of uh, uh, of uh, the covenant, sorry, the law of the covenant is designed to protect vulnerable people in society like this. And this is saying that God, Yahweh, protects, he supports, he cares for these vulnerable people. But now we get to the third line, but he thwarts this is an opposite, or this is a contrast from protecting and supporting and then thwarting, opposing the way of the wicked. So he's protecting the strangers in their in their way, their, you know, as they're going through life. He supports the orphans, he supports the widows, but he opposes, he thwarts, he, he puts an obstacle in the way of the wicked. Okay, so that's a contrasting structure there. Some more examples. Uh, Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. Uh, you know, the implication is that the world is the Lord's, even though that's not repeated in the second. Uh, and this is kind of like a further refining you notice, I mean, this is what uh, Kugel and Alter have argued, that it's not just a repetition. It's refining a little bit, but it's more or less this basic type of A equals B. The earth is the Lord's, all it contains. The world, and not just all it contains, but the ones who dwell in it, all of it belongs to God. He's not just the God of Israel. He is the God of everyone who dwells on earth. Okay, Jeremiah... 515. Here we have two bicola, both represent uh, showing this type one form here. It is an enduring nation. It is an ancient nation. This is describing Babylon. It is an enduring nation. It is an ancient nation. Similar concept being conveyed here. A nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. Again, A equals B. Not only do you not know their language, 
that's what they're saying. You don't understand even you know, like what they're saying. It's refining. It's, you know, that consequentiality. Okay. And then you even, once you begin to uh, see and understand Hebrew poetry, um, you'll see how it's even echoed in the New Testament. And here we have uh, from Jesus's words in Matthew 11, he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And if you know these basics of Hebrew poetry, you know that he is totally conforming to these basics, like standards of how Hebrew poetry works. My yoke and my burden is easy and light. Um, A equals B. Okay. Now, now we have type two. Type two, this is where um, A, and it's, you know, I use the symbol A greater than B. This is where A is the main point, which is then qualified by B. Okay. So A is the main point, and then B qualifies it. Sometimes it's a movement from the general to the specific, and it's often this is used to exhibit subordination. Okay. Now, here is uh, the first example. I'm not going to do all the lines. You can't really draw the lines like we did in type 1. Type 2, um, Psalm 66, verse 5. Come and see the works of God, who is awesome in his deeds towards the sons of men. Okay? Come and see the works of God. That's the main point. And then, now... What are the works of God, or, or you know, what is it about God that makes His works worth coming to see? That's given in the second line, uh, and be there. Who is awesome in His deeds towards the son, sons of men? The main thrust of this, though, like the main point, is what's found at the beginning. Come and see the works of God. Uh, who, and then who is awesome in his deeds towards the sons of men. Some more examples uh, from Jeremiah 2, verse 15. They have made his land a waste. His cities are in ruins without inhabitants. Um, oh, sorry. I don't know if you caught that. Siri thinks I was talking to her. Um, all right. So uh, they have made his land a waste. That's the main point. And then what does that waste look like? Cities and ruins. No inhabitants in the cities. You know, that's what it looks like. It's qualifying um, that main point. The next example, Psalm 111, uh, verse 6. He has made known to his people the power of his works. Um, that's the main thrust. And then in giving them, how did he make known to his people the power of his works? In giving them the heritage of the nations. A lot of times I look for it when I'm looking at, you know, how does B qualify A? I might be looking for it to answer a question such as who, what, when, where, why, and how. Um, just for me, it's just a helpful way to kind of process through what's happening here. Some more examples, all right? Um, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept. That's what we did. When did we do that? What caused us to do that? When we remembered Zion. That's when we did it. That's what caused us. We sat down and we wept when we remembered Zion, okay? The main point is in line A. And then also in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debts. That's the ultimate prayer there. And then it's qualifying. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Okay? But the main point is what's in line A. And then qualified in line B. Okay? Now... We have type 1, type 2, and now you could probably guess what type 3 is going to be. Type 3 is where B is the main point. Okay, so here we have uh, Psalm 63, verse 3. And this is just reversing things. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. Here, the main 
thrust of this uh, bicolon is, my lips will praise you. And then you can say, why? Why will my lips praise you? Very simply, because your loving kindness is better than life. Okay? This can be used in a parallelism of continuation, so a progression of a thought. So um, Psalm 18, verse 4, notice this continuation, how a, a thought is begun in line A and then concluded in line B. I call to Yahweh, who is worthy of praise, and I am saved from my enemies. Okay? There's the continuation, I call to Yahweh, worthy of praise, I am saved from my enemies. That's the natural progression of the thought that has um, begun in line A and then reaches its conclusion in line B. It also can be used in a parallelism of comparison, like in a simile. So Psalm 103, as a father has compassion on his children, Yahweh has compassion on those who fear him. Okay, so here we have, you know, Yahweh has compassion on the ones who fear him. And it's just like a father has compassion on his children. But the main thrust, the main point of this is what's found in line B. Okay, some more examples. Okay, a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand. This is from Psalm 91. Those two lines are kind of a type one parallelism, aren't they? It's a thousand fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand. You know, here we have thousand and 10,000 are, you know, in parallel with one another. At your side, at your right hand, you know, they're falling. But it shall not approach you. That's the main thrust. That's the main point of this, uh, of this tricolon. Okay? The next one, Psalm 34, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Okay? That's it's a continuation. I sought the Lord, he answered me, and he delivered me. It's, you know, the final result delivered me from everything that I was afraid of. All right. And let's see. Yeah, this is the last example. Psalm 121, verse 4. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Okay? God does not slumber or sleep, and he's the one who keeps Israel. All right? So, three types. A equals B. Type 2. A is the main point. Type 3. B is the main point. Okay? Now, you will have some opportunity to practice this uh, through some exercises where you're going to take some poetry from Jeremiah. Um, one of the reasons why I like to teach this is it gives you a tool to be able to carefully read through. I want you to learn how to read through you know, the biblical text carefully, slowly, and appreciating subtle details. Okay? Learning these three basic structures gives you that basic tool to be able to read through slowly, carefully, deliberately considering um, these poetical structures and paying attention to the nuances of the text. Now, um, poetry is a lot more than just what we've covered so far. Um, there are definitely some other significant features of Hebrew poetry. Um, from mechanics, uh, you know, such as the sort of parallelism that we've talked about, and then also um, meter, which we'll get to in just one second. There's also rhyme, although it doesn't follow the the straight, predictable rhyming structures that we see in, um, like in the Robert Burns poem. But we definitely saw... Um, uh, we definitely see rhyme in Hebrew poetry. Of course, you have to be able to read Hebrew to be able to appreciate that. Um, there's also, you know, metaphor and other, you know, rhetorical um, devices that are at play within Hebrew poetry. Uh, a lot of imagery, poetic imagery, and different things like that. Um, so it, the study of Hebrew poetry, it's not simple. It can actually become quite complex. Um, but this just gives you again, an appreciation of the basic structures.
Now, a brief word on Hebrew meter. Just, I think it's worth talking about just briefly here. Our understanding of Hebrew meter um, is tenuous at best. Um, we, you know, there have been some significant studies, but there's nowhere near the sort of consensus on meter as like what we have with, with the parallelism that we just talked about. Uh, there's two main approaches to, um, you know, this sort of analysis of metrical patterns. One theory, one approach is to count the total number of syllables in each colon or each um, each line of poetry like we were just looking at bicola and tricola well each of those lines is called a colon so one approach is you count the total number of syllables in each one and you analyze the patterns you know is it five syllables seven syllables is the repetition of these things like that um, and then the second theory is to count not the total number of syllables but just the accented number of of syllables in each colon. So in Hebrew, typically, each word has one accented syllable. Sometimes you'll have, you know, a chain of words, like what's called a construct chain, and those, you know, it might be, you know, um, such as, oh, an example, it's connected with the word of in English. It's oftentimes used to show possession, like, um, the book of this class, okay? That would be like a construct chain. As a succession of words, that would only have a single accented syllable. So construct chains only have a single accented syllable. So you can count the total number of syllables or you can count the, the number of accented syllables in each colon. And that's the basic way that people um, approach this. Now, there is one form of meter that does seem to be a little bit more predictable and what's called kina meter. Um, this is the meter that is commonly found in dirges or lament poems. Okay, so here we have um, Lamentations 2.5. Uh, the Lord is as an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. So here we have, um, here let me divide it. So this is where it's divided. So uh, Hayah is, he is, and Adonai, the Lord is. Hayah, Adonai, Ke'oyev. Uh, this is the Lord is as an enemy. Bela, he has swallowed up Yisrael. Each word has a single accented syllable. And so when you analyze this, when you scan this, um, scansion, um, you have three accented syllables followed by two accented syllables. Uh, Kina meter is sometimes called limping meter. This is because you have a feeling of one, two, three, one, two. One, two, three, one, two. It's a feeling like it's not quite complete. It actually has kind of a significant psychological effect when you're reading it because you naturally want to have that third beat on the second line. You want to have the completion one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. But instead, you just get one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two. And it makes you feel like you're limping along. Um, so that's kind of meter. And we do see that within. Um, very significantly, the book of Lamentations, which has long been associated with Jeremiah. Okay, so that is, again, the brief introduction to Hebrew poetry, and I hope it has been helpful and it will be a useful tool as we proceed through the course in analyzing the poetry of Jeremiah.